Welcome to this week's episode of the Inside Kingston podcast, where experienced professionals, entrepreneurs, and community leaders based in Kingston upon Thames are invited on to share their story with us. I'm your host, Amir Rochalima. This week's episode of the Inside Kingston podcast is brought to you by Holland Harn and Wills, a financial planning and wealth management firm based in Kingston upon Thames. Holland Harn and Wills specialises in retirement planning for senior professionals and successful business owners. Visit hhw-uk.com to start feeling more relaxed and confident about your financial future. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Inside Kingston podcast. I'm joined today by Anissa Bloor. Anissa is the founder of Sensational Kids Therapy, a paediatric occupational therapy practice that caters for children and young adults and offers therapy and assessment in a range of neurological disorders. What's unique about Anissa is how she draws on both her professional background and her personal background as a mother of a child with Asperger syndrome to help children and their parents connect, achieve and navigate. And be sure to listen to the end where Anissa shares with us some tips on how to thrive as a parent, as well as to help your children thrive during this time in lockdown and beyond. So whether you're interested in knowing more about occupational therapy or would like to know more about what it takes to run a successful independent business, then I hope you enjoy this episode of the Inside Kingston podcast. Welcome, Anissa Bloor, to the Inside Kingston podcast. Anissa, I'm really excited about this conversation because, well, frankly, I don't know much about pediatric occupational therapy, um, but from what I read, it seems like a really noble profession to be to be doing. And um, we haven't had anybody from your profession on our show, so I think it would be great to know more about your field of work. And I think our listeners can learn a lot from your expertise in this area too. But yeah. to kick off this conversation, I'd like to go back in time, if that's okay. So, yeah. Anita, where did you grow up? So, I grew up in South Africa, um, in a little area just outside of Johannesburg, um, which is inland. And, um, yeah, I went to school there. I was, um, I grew up in, I describe it to my friends as a posh township, because um, it's not quite a township, but it's not quite you know, what you are supposed, I'd say, used to. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's where I grew up. It's my home. Um, when I take my kids there and I take them for a little drive through, they always go, don't stop the car. <laughs> you know, they, they panic a little bit, but actually it's where I grew up. Um, and, yeah, so from there I was lucky enough to have a bursary to go to a private school in the area so um, I always think of those as it's a sponsor an African child so it was kind of like that where we had people from Europe sponsoring us to go to um, private school oh, wow. and then through that um, I managed to go to university so I was the first person in my family to go to university which was um, yeah it was amazing. Oh wow that's amazing and where did you go to university and what did you study? Okay, so I went to the University of Stellenbosch, which is down um, in the Cape, and it was truly just the best experience ever. It's the first time I've left home, first time I went in an aeroplane, um, and I studied. So, so my first year I did kind of like a general science course because I wasn't sure whether I wanted to study medicine or, um, or actually I was trying to get into medicine at that stage. Um, and that's when I discovered occupational therapy. And I saw some girls in our, um, our residence who were doing projects for occupational therapy and I got really intrigued and decided to change my choice. And I can remember um, coming home one day and my mom said to me, oh, there was a phone call and they asked whether you wanted to study medicine or um, occupational therapy and I had to choose for you. And I was like, oh, my word, because, you know, pressure from parents and what mm. they want you to do. And she said, and I chose occupational therapy. And I was like, oh, perfect. So, yeah, oh, wow. I then studied um, occupational therapy for the next four years, which is um, a degree course, which um, the, you do partly at the, the um, medical school with the med students and the physios. Um, and it was just 
fascinating yeah um and I didn't realize how aligned kind of my principles and values were to occupational therapy which is um the aim is really to not look at what you can't do and what your disabilities or difficulties are but look at what you can do and how to lead as independent a life as is possible using that um, and making adaptations teaching you skills um, you know because independence certainly I believe is is absolutely key you know it's mm. um yeah. And there's quite a lot of that that I want to unpack with you throughout this conversation, Anissa. Yeah. Um, before I do so, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your career before you set up your business? Okay. So I um, studied occupational therapy and then I practiced in South Africa for a year doing um, mental health work, uh, which is m- mainly eating disorder work with um, teenagers and young people and then a little bit of um, in a mental health hospital with um, alcohol dependency um, patients. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of 2000, we came over to London um, and I spent um, about a year working as a locum for the NHS, um, again, doing mental health, and then um, had my first, son in 2002 and because of the way visas were structured at the time and work permits I um and because my husband was out of work I went back to work and he was quite young my son was quite young and then I got a job at an amazing children's charity called um the children's trust in Tadworth which is not far from Kingston um and they do work for kids with um, acquired brain injury and profound learning difficulties. Mm. And that was really where I got quite established, I think. And I was there for about six years. And then um, in 2008, I made the decision to leave um, my lovely job to set up a private practice. And I had one client. (laughs) Um, So it was a little bit of a mad impulsive moment, but um, I did it mainly because my um, son had at that point started um, reception and he was just really struggling at school. Mm -hmm. Um, And I thought, actually, I need to be there for him. And I did this through, um, yeah, doing private work. Fantastic. Um, So, so So bringing this conversation to the present, can you tell us a little bit about your business today? Okay, so today it's kind of, it, um, it's kind of exploded um, and I, I feel like I need to take you through how it got where it is today, just Please. briefly, if you let me. So I started sure. off um, and I was basically practicing from my car. So I had my boot was full of equipment and I was driving all over the country to get work. Um, and I then um, had our garage converted in um, where we used to live in Berylands and we converted our garage and it was just a lovely little therapy room. But then because of word of mouth, um, it just expanded. And I then moved to um, to Kingston, had a little practice there. And again, it expanded and I started employing people, which is very scary, Mm. Um, you know, when you go to being responsible for someone else and their kind of their bills. Um, And that's when we ended up moving to where we are now, Iron Gate Muse, in Surbiton in 2012 and that was yeah April 2012. So Um, for for the benefit of our listeners who like me don't understand much about uh, occupational therapy or uh, pediatric occupational therapy in particular when you mentioned that you were doing work and you had your van and then you had your garage converted could you just take us through what work it is that okay. you do with, in your case, children in particular? And, and, and okay. what, what are the results that you're looking at to achieve that independence that you mentioned? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So if you think of the word occupational, you think of your occupations. So everything that, um, you know, as an adult, your mm-hmm. occupations are cooking, cleaning, you know, being a wife, being a husband, those types of things, going to work, being a friend and everything involved in that. And when you look at a child and their occupations, um, it's really just to have fun. You know, kids have to learn how to play. They learn how to write, how to um, 
to run. So it's all those gross motor skills, you know, how to ride a bike, how to swim. Then we look at all their fine motor skills. So being able to um, open their little box of raisins or being able to use a fork to stab their chicken nuggets, say, Um, and having those skills needed for those activities. Um, and, And then just playing, you know, being able to stack Lego blocks, being able to do engage in messy play, And what we um, do is we have a lot of kids who come to us because they're struggling in some area or the other. Mm -hmm. And we would then look at that, analyze what it is that they're struggling with. So um, if I can give an example, say um, tying shoelaces. So it's not just, there's so many components with that. So it's your fine motor skills, it's your visual perception, you know, looking at the laces, where they need to go. It's processing the steps of that activity. Um, And then it's your gross motor skills, you know, being able to hold your body together while you lean forward to tie your shoelace. So it's really quite complex. Um, And it's then seeing where exactly in that um, activity analysis the difficulties come in and then working on those core skills. Um, gotcha. That's fascinating. And obviously yeah. this speaks directly to your company's motto, which I believe is connect, achieve, navigate. Could you tell us a little bit about the meaning behind those words? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so connect is all about can. So we, I believe that every child can and every family can um, and the the you start with the connection, which is you know emotionally I think, and and something everyone's probably realised now, being in lockdown is that that connection is so crucial. And when I talk about connect, um, I'm actually writing a book at the moment. But when I talk about connect, I talk about um, first and foremost is for for parents to connect with themselves and to give themselves um, the, I'm trying to think of a way of describing it. So for them to realize that they are the most important and not in a selfish way or um, being narcissistic, but if that parent is not looking after themselves, they can't look after anyone else. Um, And so I I really um, emphasize to parents their own personal well-being, Um, you know, trying to look after any child, a neurotypical child is hard work. You know, it's just, it's, it's hard work. It's full on. Um, Also at the same time, taking care of yourself is, you know, for a lot of us, we have to make a conscious effort to say, right, I'm taking 20 minutes out of my day now to do some mindfulness. Um, And as, as parents, we often feel that we can't justify spending the time on ourselves. So a big part of what I say to parents is connect with yourself and acknowledge how awesome you are. Um, then we connect with our partners or our support network um, and, and our friends. And it's being able to say to them, oh, my gosh, this is so hard, you know, and not feeling like you're complaining, not feeling like you are, you know, taking up time because actually you saying that to someone else makes them think, oh my gosh, it's exactly what I'm feeling. Um, And then you connect with your child. And for some parents that can be really hard when you've had, say for example, a traumatic birth. Um, I work a lot with kids who are adopted. Um, When kids have a specific diagnosis, you know, all of that makes it quite challenging for parents to bond with them um, and, and make that connection. And I truly believe once you can do that and accept your child um, and accept them for their abilities and what they can and can't do, you know, um, it just sets your path and your journey is then so much easier. Um, and and from a child's point of view, it's it's helping them to connect with their siblings, their parents, and their friends out in the big world and and giving them those skills that they need. So, for example, if they're really struggling to connect in a classroom because they're very um, tactile defensive, so they don't like touch, um, and they find that when, you know, there's the hustle and bustle of getting your coats and stuff and they really um, struggle with that, we then work on that particular skill. 
Um, so it's really looking at each child as an individual, looking at their environment, and then doing that, um, raising that awareness of, of their abilities and how the teachers, the child minders, the parents, the grandparents can all feed into that and help um, and support them with those skills. That's absolutely um, fascinating, Anissa. That really is. Now, so I that's know that. Connect. Yeah. And, and I was just going to say on Connect, if you wouldn't mind yeah. me uh, butting in. Um, yeah. And I know it's almost impossible to ask for quote unquote quick tips from you for something so important and so fundamental as you've just described. But during yeah. this period in particular of lockdown, are there yeah. any tips you can give to parents? Um, and that could be for parents who have kids who actually do need some help or yeah. even parents that just need to do what you've just said and take some time for themselves. Are there any tips you can give parents to just try to find those 10 or 20 minutes and maybe just be a little bit introspective to, to recharge their batteries to just go again? Yeah. So, I mean, um, yeah, I, I could talk for a long time in this, but I'm, I'm going to try to not bore you. <laughs> um, so I think it's just just being kind to yourself. You know, parents mm. are so, we're so pressured by what's going on around us. And I always, you know, one of the things I say, um, I don't know why I heard it, is that comparison is the thief of joy. Mm. You know, you look at other parents and you see what they're doing and you kind of go, oh my gosh, I'm just, um, yeah, I'm not doing as well as they are. And I think it's just accept who you are, accept who your child is. And at the moment, something, because I share um, an office with my teenager and something he's heard me say over and over to the parents I've been speaking with is that you are their parent. You are not their teacher. You are not their therapist. Mm -hmm. You are first and foremost, you are their, their parent. You are their support. You are there to help them through this period of quite a lot of uncertainty and a lot of change. And, you know, kids pick up on our anxiety. They have their own anxiety and we might not realize it. Um, and it's just making them know that no matter what's happening outside is that you are there, things are going to happen as always, as far as it can. So your love is still there for them. Um, and I think that's really quite important is to remember that you are, you are their parent first and foremost. And I know everyone's trying so hard with homeschooling and, you know, um, and the parents I'm working with is trying to do the therapy sessions. And actually, I, you know, it's the first session that I've done with any parent has just been saying, and how are you taking time for yourself? I mean, yesterday I said to a mom who's got really full on, I said to her, um, she said, the only time I get to myself is when the kids are in bed or when I go to the loo. I said, well, then you take your phone and you go to the loo and you sit there and you catch up on Facebook. <laughs> and catch up on your, you know, WhatsApp groups, and then you flush the toilet afterwards. So they think you were in the loo, and do not feel guilty about that. You know, that's one of the other things is just don't feel guilty. Just yeah. remind yourself that actually how awesome you are. Um, and I think in terms of taking time, it's just just stopping for a second. You know, if you're feeling a bit anxious, um, it's just thinking, oh, I can actually hear the birds and look at the clouds, you know, if they're grey, look at the different shades of grey, you know, it's, it's, it's all amazing. And just taking that few minutes just to, to breathe as well, you know, and that's so important is um, I spend a lot of time teaching parents and their kids just how to breathe um, and to breathe effectively. Um, so, yeah, so it's just, it's just, taking time and and don't see it as it's an excuse you know or it's being selfish um is another thing I say to the parents is to get outside you know even if you're in your garden if you don't have a garden then use your your little um exercise slot and just get outside and just appreciate being outside so when you're outside don't go on your phone you know try not to chat just enjoy being there in that um in that moment that's that's those are fantastic tips thank you for that so we've covered connect um would you mind taking us through achieve and navigate yeah absolutely so achieving is 
So I've gone through kind of a whole phase of parenting. And for me, achieving is not about your um, your grades. It's not about the academics. Um, it's being able to do something that you want to do. So setting a goal and being able to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so often I work with kids and we have the... Um, their plans and the parents have their goals and they might go, you know, I want him to be able to get into Eton or, you know, things like that. And then I see some parents who write their goals and they say to me, I want them to be happy. And that's when I kind of go, okay, this is, we're onto something here because I, I truly believe that achievement is, can be anything, you know, it can be as much as doing your own tie so you don't have to be the last to change a PE. Um, and through achievement, we work on all the core skills. So when we work with the child, I'll be looking at their gross motor skills, fine motor skills, sensory processing, which is just a massive field. We look at their emotional regulation, visual perception, which can affect things like doing a puzzle. Um, you know, emotional regulation is, again, it's being able to respond appropriately to a situation where you might be feeling quite uh, stressed. Um, And then we look at executive function, which again is a, you know, it's a massive field where we're just looking at how well you can organize yourself, which again, for the older kids, it's being able to look at your timetable for tomorrow, pack your bag appropriately, know what homework needs to go in first, so what you need to focus on first. Um, You know, so it's looking at all of those skills and getting the child to set their goals um, and the parents to set their goals and to get that independence. So I think once we can achieve those little bits and pieces for ourselves, we can then move on to navigating, which is being able to to live and to problem solve in the moment and to, um, you know, plan about how you're going to go about, say, for example, getting ready for a play date. So for a lot of kids, you know, a play date is just a play date, but for equally so many going on a play date, you have to think about, okay, so I'm used to the school rules and I'm used to my parents' rules. Mm -hmm. So now there's another adult who I have to listen to. Now I have to navigate sharing toys. That's not mine, but I do want to play with it. I have to navigate playing with my friends' siblings. You know, so it's it's looking at all of those areas. Um, And it's, you know, it's not, it doesn't happen First you connect, then you achieve, then you navigate. It happens all kind of all together um, and different areas will obviously take, um, you know, the um, precedence at different times. So, yeah, it's um, it's being able to just connect, achieve and navigate. Um, That's fascinating. That really is fascinating, Anissa, and I appreciate you taking us uh, through that. Um, yeah. For our listeners that might be interested in a career in occupational therapy, what are the yeah. first steps you'd recommend they take? So I would say the first steps for me would be to find um, an occupational therapist that's local to you and ask if you can do some work experience. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd also say look at occupational therapy in all of the different settings. So we currently, there are occupational therapists who work in A&E and they work on the rapid response teams. They are occupational therapists who work in, um, you know, they work in spinal injuries or brain injuries. Um, So it's not just about kids. Um, And even when you're looking at working with kids, there are all the different areas that you can look at as well. So it's trying to get as much experience as possible in, all the different areas of occupational therapy. Some are quite often, certainly um, in the past for um, pediatric OTs, I always welcome um, volunteers to run our summer groups and just to see actually what it is about, um, you know, and, and also going into schools, um, they're usually very happy to have um, someone shadowing the OT at schools as well. So it's just to get that kind of first-hand experience, but also to get the wider understanding um, of what it is that you think you might want to do. Yeah. Anissa, 
What are some of the key business lessons you've learned throughout your life? Wow. Okay. So <laughs> I'm going to start by saying when I um, started my business, I was very naive. Um, I And I always say, and I've always had the same where I never planned to be a businesswoman. I'm an occupational therapist at heart. Um, and I think gosh it's been it's been quite a um, a roller coaster for um business i would say one of my key lessons that i've learned is to plan <laughs> make a plan and really think things through i um um can be quite impulsive <laughs> And in some ways, that's been great because it's meant that I've just jumped in and done things where maybe other people would have been a bit more hesitant. But obviously, in other ways, it's like, oh, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have bought that uh, fantastic uh, peanut ball or something that costs 700 pounds. Not that there is one that is, but I'm just making that up. But, um, you know, so it's um, it's to really plan and just um, take time. Um, and to your credit, really, the the energy that you you and, and I'm a bit like that too. So I can I'm kindred spirits in that sense. The yeah. energy that we we have when we impulsively jump into something is a lot better harnessed when we're feeding it into a plan, right? Yeah, yeah, no, Absolutely. definitely, and I, you know, and um, it's been quite interesting because my um, my youngest son has been doing business studies for GCSEs. Mm. So he's been coming to me and saying these words to me and I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and and he, he often says to me, Mom, how do you have a business? You know, um, how do you not know what this is and your um, projections and your cash flow and all of those things? And I guess I've just stumbled upon it. Um, and... And that's okay too. Um, I think it's been a little bit more fun <laughs> yeah. doing it that way. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think it's um, it's another thing with the business is to just really step back sometimes and think about what it is that you want to achieve. So to remember your why, you know, um, why you've set up the business, what your plans are, and um, and just keep that, always keep that in mind so you don't move too far away from that. Um, yeah, I definitely yeah. second that. Anissa, <laughs> when you look back at your career journey today, what are you most proud of? Oh, my gosh. Um, I'd have to say probably the impact I've made on families and their kids. Um, you know, I've obviously been doing this for a long time and I um, do sometimes get the odd little email or message from someone who I saw when they were five and they're now 20, um, wow. you know, or and um, someone, one of my kids I used to work with find me on LinkedIn and he is a boy who has, um, he's a, um, a wheelchair user, he's got cerebral palsy and he messaged me and he said, hi, do you remember me? And I'm like, yeah, of course I remember you. And he's now a drone pilot, you know. Oh, wow. And you're like, wow, I never, when I was working with him, would have thought that that could be an option, you know. So it's just um, the impact that I do believe that we've made on the kids and their families. Um, yeah, I think that's something to be quite proud of. That definitely is. You should be super proud of that, Anisa. That is marvellous. Yeah. Anissa, what next for you and your business? Are there any projects in the pipeline you can tell us about? There are always projects. <laughs> um, so I am currently working on finishing my book. I'm writing a book um, called Parenting the Conundrum Child hmm. um, and the can-do approach to discovering their unique abilities. So I'm going to get that out. Um, I also when I look at just how we, I think with the whole COVID-19 and having to do teletherapy, that's obviously opened up a whole new world for me in terms of seeing kids in their environment and trying to do a lot more around that. Um, I think I definitely want to do some work for um, a little project for the summer because usually what we do is we have um, summer groups and my plan is to extend that and start that a bit earlier for the parents who might be a bit worried that their kids have fallen behind. Um, yeah, so it's just it's just to 
keep on going really um exciting times ahead yeah Definitely. Good. Um, As we start to wrap up, I'd like to ask you a few quick fire questions that our listeners are always interested in. So, okay. Anissa, what do you do to relax outside of the office? I walk my dog. Um, yeah, I walk and I read. Sounds lovely. And talking of reading, are there any books that you've recently read that you'd recommend to our listeners? Oh, gosh, I read a range of things. I've read some really good business books, um, Key Person of Influence, Oversubscribed, and by Daniel Priestley. Um, I also read just a range of just books, fiction books. Um, What I have found is that I'm really doing um, a lot more podcasts, listening to podcasts, Mm -hmm. um, because I find that's a really effective use of time. Um, so I listen to just a range of podcasts and the tip is to listen to them at 1.2 or 1.5 times the speed. You get through loads more podcasts that way. I absolutely um, second that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and everyone there, sounds so much happier, you know, when they are speaking faster. So yeah, you really get into it. Absolutely. Um, yes. Are there any movies or TV shows you've recently watched that you'd recommend to our listeners? Oh, it just depends what they, uh, enjoy um i am enjoying gangs of london um i do watch a lot of things which my kids walk into the room and they go oh my gosh not this again like (laughs) parks and recreation which is just completely just me time you know it's Um, hilarious actually (laughs) i think because i i have so much seriousness at work um, I sometimes try and just watch really light-hearted things on TV, like The Tiger King. Um, yes, I admit I've watched it. <laughs> um, and, yeah, so it's it's light-hearted. Sometimes I'll go for something more serious. Um, yeah, I'm really bad at watching horror movies, um, and my eldest son is obsessed with horror movies. So. <laughs> I do make this, especially now we've said one night a week, we'll watch a horror movie, but it's just, it's really entertaining for them to uh, watch a horror with me. (laughs) Oh, that's cool. Finally, where can people go to find more about you and your business? So there's the website, sensationalkids.co.uk, our our Facebook page um, where I often do little videos, like I did a little breathing video on there. And they can find me on LinkedIn as well. So, yeah. Excellent. And for the benefit of our listeners, I'll make sure I add these resources to the show notes. Anissa, thank you for joining us here on the Inside Kingston podcast. It's been a pleasure getting to know your story. Yeah, no, thank you very much for having me. Um, And yeah, and good luck with the rest of it. That wraps up another episode of the Inside Kingston podcast. Make sure to check out our guests' website, pay them a visit, and help spread the word about what they're doing. If you have any questions or know someone who should be a guest on the show, please feel free to get in touch. I would also love it if you could go to iTunes and leave us a review and a five-star rating. We work hard to bring on some great guests and getting a review from you is one way to help the podcast rate well on iTunes so that others can find and enjoy the show too. Thanks for listening.